Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Kelly Lake, Global Head of Corporate Learning for KGL Learning. I see that uh, we still have some folks that are joining in on the webinar today. We'll just give a few moments and then we will go ahead and kick off. I see a couple more just joined. Wonderful. We have quite a large number of people that have registered for today. Uh, numerous global organizations will be joining us as well. And I'd like to welcome you all officially to the KGL Learning Industry Webinar on Financial Services, Learning Trends for 2021, a new approach to workforce enablement. Today, the webinar is scheduled to be 60 minutes. All attendees are placed on mute. And let's go ahead and kick off. So let's, I want to start the uh, webinar today by first thanking all of you. I realize that everybody has an extremely busy schedule, um, especially now with all of the transition in the market. Uh, but I think we have a tremendous amount of good topics that we'll be able to cover today. We have two expert uh, speakers joining us. I'll introduce those in a couple of minutes. We'll introduce both of them and find out a little bit more about them. Uh, we'll kick off today just talking. I want to talk a little bit about the landscape and learning and development across the board. Uh, just to give you some level setting of our discussion, uh, bring you up to speed on where we are, and then we're going to dive right into the most important section, which is the financial services learning trends. Uh, we're going to cover a little bit of what happened in 2020. We'll also discuss a little bit more of those learning trends, how they're applicable not only to wealth management, but also to retail banking as well. Um, additionally, we'll delve down a little bit more on that learning strategy, and the workforce enablement. Now, the workforce enablement will be consistent of a lot of different ideas that you know both of our speakers have. We'll incorporate some of the best practices from the industry as well, especially now with a lot of remote workers. You know, how are we looking at a workforce both on-site, off-site? What are those different areas of skill development that we need the most important? How do we bridge the gaps between leadership and you know all of our employees? Additionally, we'll talk about the technology landscape within financial services. Uh, we'll give you a little bit of a, a gamut from where you know, companies are currently using, uh, you know, are leveraging different types of technology to move learners forward, well, an element, LMS perspective, or from an experiential learning platform. Additionally, we'll talk about the idea of learning analytics and measurability, uh, where we are in financial services, the importance of measuring learning data and how that translates to um, developing new learning strategies across the board. Finally, we'll wrap up. We will have a Q&A session. I will tell you on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a questions box. I highly recommend any questions that you have, please enter it in the, that box as well. And if you have a specific question for one of our presenters, please you know, address it accordingly. So we'll give about 15 minutes towards the end of the webinar to address those questions. Um, if we get way too many questions, which I'm hoping for, you know, we'll be able to address them and, and provide feedback as we go forward. The webinar is being recorded, and it will be live and available for you uh, on our KGL Learning website. And those of you who have registered for this, we will be sending you a follow-up email with the link to this webinar, so you'll be able to take a look at it. Um, I understand, again, you know, it's uh, scheduled for 60 minutes, and you may want to go back and revisit specific titles as you look forward in this. Okay, so that's our agenda for today. Um, let's go ahead, and I would love to introduce our two uh, speakers today. Um, first of all, I'm very honored to have the both of them here today. I have worked with both of them for over 20 years, um, and very honored that they've taken time. And very rarely do you able to access leaders that have been in the industry for quite a long time to hear their best practices. Firstly, I'd like to introduce Wendy Austin, Wealth Management Consultant and the former Chief Learning Officer for BNY Mellon. Wendy has way over 25 years of experience on global leadership and performance and development, has led global teams, um, huge acquisitions and mergers, uh, and has definitely been a pinnacle player in the wealth management uh, learning arena. Um, today, Wendy joins us to provide her that, that high-level expertise in financial services and specifically in wealth management. Wendy, welcome to the webinar. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Bill Keel, 
Um, Bill um, is joining us today. He is the VP Director of Learning and Development for Main Street Bank and is a leader in the L&D and also specifically brings a, a huge skill set in instructional design strategy. Um, like I said, well over 25 years, Bill has been working with a lot of different financial institutions. Today he's on the call to provide that expertise um, and specifically his background currently within retail banking. So Bill, welcome to the call. Thank you very much, Kelly. I look forward to being a panelist and of course hearing what you and Wendy have to say as well. Excellent, Bill. Appreciate it. And, and I'm honored again to have both of you here. Um, I think what you're going to be conveying across the board is going to be very pinnacle for a lot of different organizations to be able to hear your insights, best practices, you know, what's worked well, and, and obviously some challenges that we've had across the board. Just to add a little bit more background, I introduced myself briefly in the beginning. Um, I have over 25 years plus experience in learning and performance. Um, I focus on global strategies, RFI, uh, RFP development with a lot of different organizations, developing innovative solutions um, from learning transformation through technology and developing ecosystems for a lot of uh, the top 1,000 um, companies uh, globally in the world right now. Uh, developing those ecosystems definitely has been a tremendous challenge over the last year or so, but bringing that together with the best practices and our speakers today, I think you're gonna gain a lot of insight. KGL Learning, just to give you just a little bit more of a background on KGL, the company, um, that I represent and, and work with. I have a tremendous amount of talented uh, people within the organization. Um, we are a full service provider of immersive services and learning and development. Um, we focus on workforce enablement solutions. Uh, we've spent quite a lot of time in the industry. My teams are located throughout the world, you know, specifically to in Mumbai. I'm very proud of the organization we have together and the ability to bring in the next step of innovation to solve some of the problems that you may be facing. And one mention, I'm extremely proud that we've just been awarded as one of the top learning providers and experiential learning solutions and technologies. So that being said, Wendy and Bill, I think we can get ready to dive down into the most important parts of our webinar today. Excellent. So what I want to share with you uh, is just a high level overview of the industry right now, just a level set uh, on where we are. And if you move to the next slide, please. Perfect. So understanding a little bit more, obviously coming from 2020, what we're seeing moving forward, obviously virtual learning and the remote aspect of it is gravely important to organizations. Being forced to adapt and to adjust <laughs> Uh, we're calling this year the year of adaptability to how do we deal with remote issues? Are we able to create training the same way that we've had before? What nuances do we need? How are we looking at that evolved workforce to support them? And this slide, just to give you a little bit of background, shows some stats with a variation of the different approaches. So that large move, obviously, that's in place right now. I think companies, too, you know, have come back and said, we need to redesign our programs, obviously, you know, those that are focused on instructional-led as opposed to uh, virtual, you know, are now redefining the blend or the blended learning, being able to use different types of approaches. We see that a large change in the roles of l and leaders throughout different organizations have emerged greatly. Whereas, you know, maybe you haven't as a leader been fully immersed in the change management aspect of it, now are being called forward to you know, work with your organization on, on those different initiatives. Who knows those learners better than L&D leaders? So the rules have emerged. You know, we've all wear multiple hats. The biggest joke with L&D leaders, right? We wear thousands of different hats, and we're used to adjusting to that aspect of it. So not only the change management, more communication roles. You know, working uh, more closely to the business to ensure that the gaps that have been identified are now top priority to ensure that the business goals are met. So I think, you know, that being understood, you know, in 2020, we saw gaps being identified that maybe organizations haven't seen before. Gaps, you know, in different skill sets. You know, roles have changed drastically um, where we've had to, you know, lay off individuals, hire people back. You know, we're looking at closing those, those gaps within those different areas. And it's a huge focus in L&D. And I think that, you know, being able to hear next from Wendy and Bill on more specific issues related to financial services, I think that will definitely showcase 
you know, what those approaches look like or best practices look like, as we talked about a little bit more of an innovation perspective. And as we know within financial services, you know, there's uh, a great uh, gap between how technology is being used in the past or how it was used in the past and how it's currently being used. So let's go ahead and move into the next section. Um, and we can start talking a little bit more in regards to um, the specific trends within financial services and insight. So let's go ahead and, and give a little bit more. What we thought we would do for our speakers today is pose a little bit more strategic questions. This way we can dive down more specifically into what does that look like. Now with you know, Wendy's perspective, Wendy comes from wealth management, she comes from working with numerous clients, gives a little bit more of a global perspective on that aspect. Bill obviously has a tremendous background across the board, but really brings that expertise in what's happening in retail for both, you know, um, the struggles with on-site versus, you know, remote working. I think one of the, the first things to start off with uh, for our speakers is, you know, we've seen so many different challenges in 2020 obviously across the board but i thought maybe we could share a little bit more wendy we'll start with you what you're seeing or what you have seen in 2020 even leading into 2021 on some of those challenges within financial services wendy if you would please mind to address that great thank you so much kelly and welcome bill it really is an honor to be here and as kelly stated financial services really was very upended in 2020 some of the obstacles um, are obvious uh, but important to talk about technology was an obstacle right out of the gate some people had bandwidth issues some people had networks crashing uh, the working from home scenario was um, totally new for a large part of the workforce lots of distractions we all know about the distractions sharing space there was also a huge obstacle in engagement. So from a learning perspective, keeping the learners engaged was extremely difficult. And that's gonna be really critical going forward that uh, learning is built to be much more engaging. Also, one of the things that a lot of people don't really talk about is isolation. So people were forced into isolation and everything went virtual, which is very different than seeing someone in the kitchen, in the by the water cooler, you know, passing them in the hallway, having these discussions, going to lunch together. So communications completely changed. And I really feel that communications became an obstacle. Um, some managers and leaders were not as great as communicating as they could have been. And that's definitely something that I see in 2021. I'll save that for the next question. The other thing that really was a huge obstacle is the whole uncertainty of everything. We've never as a nation been faced with what occurred in 2020. So there was fear, there was, as it related to work, uh, there was, you know, hiring, how do I hire people? It's all virtual now. Uh, when are we actually going to go back to bricks and mortar to an office? are we ever going to go back is it business as usual um and there's also something on the client side that i want to point out as an obstacle which was trust lots of studies have been done and trust really weakened a lot especially in the wealth management space excellent wendy i really appreciate that as well bill i'll pose the same question to you um, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit more of what you saw as far as challenges that, that you had to face, you know, obviously being, you know, in, in an institution yourself, um, would you mind please sharing your, your feedback on that? Yes, thank you, Kelly. And oh, Wendy, in the time I've gotten to know you, I've always found your insights to be so valuable. You oh, really touched you. upon things that honestly, I think I'm the only one out there experiencing them, but no, we're all in that same boat. <laughs> I had one of my colleagues ask me, how would you describe 2020 in the learning and development world? And the first thing that honestly came to mind was, I felt like I was in the spotlight and tap dancing to a new routine I've never done before, but I had to get it right. 
to your point, we, we had our support teams that were sent home to work remotely during 2020. We're all very used to in banking here working on site. The branch locations kept on site, but my first thing that kept me up at night was how are we going to ensure that business will be as usual? We've worked so hard to preserve the exceptional customer experience, not missing a beat, and I would be getting phone calls from employees working remotely, not even sure how to add a printer to their laptop. And I'm thinking, oh boy, you know, all of these things that are slowing them down, uh, making sure that we have the appropriate training and tools in place so they don't miss a beat. So just one of those big things in my mind. But I'll tell you what else I've really learned about us as an institution. We do love our classroom training. I mean, most of the training we do is classroom. It's what we know. It's, it's very comfortable having the employees in front of us. It's not to say that we don't do any type of virtual learning, but that's just our comfort level. And we realize all of a sudden, we now have to try to teach employees literally in a virtual environment more often than not. And what was challenging was, to your point, Wendy, keeping them all engaged. We know we have some of those out there that will multitask during a webinar and they're off helping customers or they're doing something else and just really trying to keep them focused. But I'm really getting better at my tap dancing routine and I think we're making progress. Excellent. Very good. Well, I thank the both of you for sharing your insights on that. And and one of the biggest challenges, obviously, for a lot of different organizations is adapting to the remote learning. It's a different skill set in developing. And, and Bill, you being uh, such a, an amazing instructional designer as well, understand that designing for uh, an adult audience, you know, that is a little bit different from being able to do short micro learnings of five minutes here, 10 minutes here, you know, when you're on site, as opposed to here's let's let's roll out some training, uh, some online uh, training that's a little bit longer than folks are used to sitting there, right? And then to your point, Wendy, about the distractions, as we all know that, because we've all experienced that as we go through. So I appreciate that, uh, the both of you bringing that um, to the attention of the webinar today. I think it's very valuable. So let's move on to the next question. Um, and question number two focuses a little bit more on where we are current state. You know, we're in February. Uh, we're coming out of, you know, um, a little bit more of that captivity. You know, well, we've talked about learning captivity a little bit, um, but different trends that are happening. And, and I'm a big one to say trends are great. Um, I'm calling them a little bit more of expectations within the market right now to how are we evolving with those? You know, we're hearing different things. Um, you know, the slide, you know, I put some different items up here to, to get thoughts going in regards to, you know, different points that you've mentioned before. And, you know, we've heard, you know, skill enablement, we've heard um, reskilling, upskilling, we, you know, we're hearing more about, you know, the ability to, to have organizational redesign and what does that look like. So, Bill, I'll start back with you on this one. Uh, just to let me know what you're seeing um, within trends for this particular year, please. Oh, yes, Kelly, and I have to tell you, it feels like we can go in so many directions when it comes yeah. to those trends. I think one of the biggest ones on my mind, as I had mentioned before, was really leaping beyond the classroom. I know that there are tools out there that can help us with multiple delivery channels. And here's the reality. I mean, even before 2020, when you have staffing as it is and someone calls in, all of a sudden that other person can't come to training and be there. Or even now where we really see a decline in lobby traffic, we're not really getting that contact with the customers directly. And I really made, made me think about, hmm, there must be other ways we can really reach out to those individuals and really just beyond the virtual learning, but in how many other ways? And I really think about that concept of workforce enablement. And I say to myself, it really is important to make sure that we are prepared for anything. And I do a disservice if I'm not preparing my employees for what's around the corner. No question about it. One of the experiences of 2020 that really opened up my eyes was when we were working on relief loans with the commercial lending team, 
you know, again, everyone used to being in the office and working together. Now they're all working in collaboration online. So you know, we were finding ways of how we can come together and get things done and moving forward. So really taking that leap beyond the classroom is going to be one of the bigger trends I know we'll be focusing in on. But it's also opening up my eyes once again to just being so comfortable with classroom training, looking at my courses and making sure that we can adopt them for a virtual training environment because there's a very big difference. No question about it. I was actually really impressed with one of my employees who typically does the sales training in the classroom environment. And really without missing a beat, she thought about it and started doing virtual teams meetings with the groups in terms of getting the team together and just talking online about what's going on, what are the skill sets we really want to further develop on and role playing. So really those are the things we're going to be seeing out there more often this year and it did also make me think about you know, the word of leadership you know our managers again doing a great job with really trying to handle what's out there they have staff that are working remotely and, and staff that are on site boy how do you manage your team when you have people all over the place but you're focusing in on one goal I think a little more attention and change management and how do we really prepare those employees for what's around the corner? That's key. That's what I'm seeing up ahead. Excellent, Bill. I, I think that very much, you know, the points that you're bringing up and you're raising, a lot of different organizations are struggling with that blended approach. And, you know, um, one of the, the quickest things is uh, organizations are just, you know, what they're called throwing training, you know, into a virtual mode, um, but not necessarily listening to what the learners need. So your example of your employees is perfect across the board. And then also with the leadership discussion, you know, uh, a lot of leaders have identified, you know, we, we don't particularly trust the e-learning because we're not able to, to touch that. We don't know how valuable that is to our learners and is that the right thing to do? So I, I think you raise a lot of excellent points on that. So thank you. Wendy, I'll pose the same question to you in regards to what you're seeing with your clients across the board. If you wouldn't mind sharing just a little bit of your insight, please. Sure, and I'll just piggyback on uh, a lot of what Bill said. You know, learning strategies have to completely change. We need mm -hmm. to deal better with change in general. And that brings up change management, which is really on the forefront of 2021. Whatever your organization is, financial services or any vertical, if you are not, if your learning and development employees are not on the forefront of change management and not in front of it, then you are not going to succeed. Um, the ability to adapt really has a direct impact on your business's bottom line. And it's absolutely critical that as learning and development professionals, you get behind that. I will say also flexibility is going to be absolutely key and transparency. Um, E-learning, Bill mentioned, uh, you know, doing virtual training and e-learning has to be improved. Uh, gaming, there needs to be more interaction. People are sick and tired of sitting on a virtual web call and it's the same old death by PowerPoint. So you really organizations in order to stay competitive and remain competitive they need to up their e-learning game either they don't have e-learning or they need to enhance it um, there needs to be more activities more interaction and there also needs to be better follow-up we've also um you know in with the gaps in technology there needs to be a trend of probably purchasing um, either by using consultants or other vendors. Also, upskilling is absolutely key, and there's lots of articles out there about it. Uh, employees really need reskilling uh, to stay current. You know, roles are comp have completely changed. There's blended roles now. People have are wearing one, two, four hats. Sometimes they're wearing it for a little while. Sometimes it's a permanent thing. Um, leaders are having to communicate in a different way. So it's going to be very important that digital skills are enhanced and learning has to be bite-sized. We talk about it, Kelly mentioned micro-learning. It has to be in small snippets. 
you know, one, you know, sitting on a webinar and just listening for an hour and then make it maybe taking an assessment, gone are those days. You will not engage the learner at all. Um, also, mentoring mentoring is really become a huge trend and we've seen a big uptick in my clients with their mentorship programs they're really on the rise in the industry really encouraging a lot of self-training um, and building a learning culture so, frankly some of the organizations that i've been consulting with they don't have a learning culture so um, the other thing that i would just end with is that we need as a whole learning industry and financial services, we need to up the client experience. Customers and clients um, do not have the trust they had prior to the pandemic. And we really need to make that client experience better internally and externally. Very good. And sure, Bill, I'm, I'm sure you echo the, uh, the client experience as well, uh, focusing on that, um, ensuring that, you know, Competitiveness is, is very important. I think that both of you bring up incred incredibly good topics on this um, and being able to identify, you know, we're hearing so many different things, but, you know, basically how those things are being implemented, which leads me to my very next question. Um, and Wendy, we'll, we'll start with you on this one, but I think okay. for an overall approach to um, looking at these trends, you know, what are you currently seeing in regards to organizations implementing these trends here? You know, we talked about the customer service, we talked about experience, excuse me, we talked about upskilling and reskilling. You know, it's also that continuous learning, you know, so we're talking about a little bit more about the learning styles of different individuals, you know, from, you know, executive leadership down to those folks that are on the front lines working every single day. Um, and how are we bringing the innovation into it? So what are you seeing, Wendy, you know, amongst your clients and also in the industry with, you know, that strategy to implement some of those trends. Well, Kelly, I have to tell you, it starts with a clear communication plan. And that might sound very obvious, but many organizations that I consult with do not have a learning plan. They maybe don't have any dedicated learning professionals. Um, maybe it's part of their job. They do it on the corner of their desk. In some cases, with larger organizations, they do have a set uh, learning organization, but do they have an updated communication plan? There needs to be a re-education of learners. There needs to be a set strategy for upskilling. Um, we talked about upskilling earlier and reskilling, but there has to be a strategy against it. You can't just talk about it and maybe do one webinar or do an e-learning course. There has to be continual um, a continual strategy that you are looking at. Also, there needs to be an investment in subject matter experts, whether they're internal or I'm seeing more work on the consulting side, using subject matter experts, people calling me and saying, hey, I need a coach, I need a mentor, I need um, a webinar on teams and how they can work better virtually because it is such a different world. Also, I have to say with my clients, I am seeing an investment in technology. So better analytics is huge out there. People are looking for more data, data under the data. Uh, financial services, we just love data. We're driven with lots of data. So the, in order to get the proper ROI, we need more data. Excellent, very good feedback. I appreciate that too. And Wendy, you know, you talked a little bit in regards to building the strategy or the blueprint for learning um, and working with organizations. Do you see in wealth management um, more of a CLO role or do you, who is, do you see developing that strategy in wealth management? That's, that's an interesting trend that I've seen. It used to be several years ago, there were lots and lots of chief learning officers in organizations. Seeing less and less of chief, chief learning officers and seeing more of what I like to call unique titles, um, where it's a blended approach. So it might be chief people officer or you drop the chief completely. It might be head of engagement and learning. Um, and with that comes different roles. And uh, again, we are learning is changing along with the learners. So we need to make sure that we are very fresh. And within wealth management, I would have to say that 
there's more of an awareness now that everything's online, it's in your face. So as a manager, managers and owners of businesses are seeing that they desperately need more learning. So they're going out and buying it if they don't have it in-house. So consultants are seeing an uptick in helping in the short term and the long term, doing a lot of train the trainer approaches so that they can uh, have the skill set to actually do it in-house for the long term. Excellent. Wonderful. Bill, I'll pose uh, the same question, you know, from a strategic perspective, from how you're seeing things. You share a little bit more about, you know, your prioritization or, or how you're planning to roll out some of the key areas that we've identified as trends within your organization. Yes, and I really have to echo Wendy when she talks about having a plan. You know, the best laid plans can always fall apart at any time. And it really was a lesson to really discover that. You could have a plan at some levels, but you really need to be spot on and thinking ahead. I know one of the things that really gave me thought was taking a look at our vendors and what products and services they currently offer us from a training perspective. And is it really leveraging what we want to do going forward? Or do we want to invest in new vendors? Because I really learned time is of the essence. If I have to worry about how am I going to roll out this training through various and multiple channels, I'm not going to get to the masses in time as I need to. So that is definitely one of the biggest approaches that are really valuable to us right now. And I really think about that self-paced learning environment. I would love to be everywhere whenever one of my employees have some struggle or question. It's not always possible, though. Can't be there. But boy, can we use self-paced learning in a new way to really provide them with that knowledge on demand? I think it's one of the things that I'm more and more appreciating in life. In fact, I'm also a big believer in what they call adoptive learning. And that is where the training itself really models and changes in the way in which the employee is going through the training program. And that concept always fascinated me. I always felt there's, there's room for that someplace. I remember reading a book about writing instructional objectives. And what I loved about it was how the author would, would teach you something in the book. Then he would ask you to evaluate an objective. And if you think this is correct, go to page two. If you think this is correct, go to page four. So if you were going to the answer that you thought was correct but really wasn't, he takes you on a different path to make sure you understand the point of the lesson. So I always said, there's always room like that. And I think one of those approaches I want to take, especially with technology, the way it is today, is that adoptive learning approach. But of course, of all this, I also want to be sure that my trainers are just as prepared for that newer technology, for what's around the corner. So we're looking into those avenues to really be more well-defined on what it is today to be a trainer in the organization world and, of course, be able to deliver however we can that's most effective. And I was really glad that Wendy was touching upon learning analytics because that's something on the forefront of my mind. We're not maybe quite there yet, but I know it's something we want to start approaching. Excellent, Bill. And we're going to talk about analytics in just a few minutes. And, um, you know, I totally believe that when you're looking at personalized learning across the board and adaptive learning, it, it's so vitally important now, even from a remote perspective, because as a learner is going through a course, they're able to, uh, to pick and choose their learning style or adaptability, depending on the course information, whether it's from a virtual perspective, uh, it's from, you know, multiple different learning types. So that, you know, we've seen that and, and developed that tremendously in the market over the last several years, but now is definitely on the forefront of that. Um, and then we're also seeing a blend between personalized learning and the corporate objective. So coming together from a, a different approach across the whole entire learning landscape. So I think those are excellent perspectives and, and definitely will help people to start, you know, thinking a little bit more about their strategy and what works internally for them as well. Okay, so let's go ahead to the next question that we have here, which focuses more on technology. We, we've heard both of you talk a little bit about technology and, you know, within financial services, as we all know, 
Um, we may not be ahead of the game when it comes to, to technology, but developing that, that learning strategy for technological advancements and what works well and what doesn't work well, whether it's a system approach like an LMS or an experiential learning platform, or it might be something that we're talking about with AI. Um, you know, I heard both of you touch a, a little bit on gamification, but what is that looking like? And also, you know, from a mobile learning perspective, we've seen mobile learning has been on the forefront of, you know, global learning for, for quite a long time, but the availability of adapting it to our strategy is, is really also something to think about. And Wendy, you had mentioned a little bit about mentors. Um, obviously now, you know, you know, we've released at KGL a whole entire onboarding program you know, which is a virtual approach um, to help organizations onboard employees. And one part of that is gamification, um, being able to utilize that as an onboarding tool and also virtual mentors. So Wendy, I think that, you know, your point about mentors, how can we help individuals? And then Bill, when you raise the question, like we can't be there all the time, you know, when a learner is in need. So how are we building out that strategy? So maybe, Bill, if you could share just maybe a little bit more insight from the technology, you know, um, what you're seeing, you know, within your organization, but even what you're seeing, you know, externally, you know, from, you know, identifying the next step for technology for your organization. Yes, Kelly. Talking with my peers in the banking industry, I think we all have the same mindset. And certainly when we were putting together our budgets and having our wish list, I'm sure they were more than thrilled to see what we had in mind. But all in the end, it's really all important and good stuff. The first thing, of course, that came to my mind was looking at our learning management system. Right now, we use ours really for tracking training, but I really think we can be using it for so much more. I think about those multiple delivery channels that I keep envisioning and seeing and reading about, and I'm thinking that's probably going to be the key, really focusing in on what an LMS can bring to us and really bring it together, make it a very well-rounded experience for the employee. I like to use the term a lot in my bank, on-demand training. Mm -hmm. I like to be able to know that at any time, my employees can go and learn about a particular topic when they have that moment of time, if it's in between customers or whatever else may be going on. So I think there's going to be a lot more with LMS and what they can bring to us in the training industry. Certainly in the banking industry, we're not usually the leaders in terms of technology in the training world, but Certainly, we adopt to it very well, and we're going to definitely continue to do so. But interestingly, you also said gamification. And I thought it was one of those things that at first was maybe a passing phase some time ago, but then I think about Well, Bill, I think we lost you there for a second. We'll give you a chance to come back. We lost audio on that. But while you're uh, trying to connect back out there, Wendy, why don't we move that over the question to what you're seeing as far as technology and wealth management. I know personally that, you know, you've implemented uh, several different learning management systems, uh, and I was fortunate enough to be a part of some of that as well. Um, so maybe you would give a little bit more insight on what you're seeing within your different clients. Um, and maybe some best practices that you've also seen too, and a little bit more from an innovative perspective. Sure, sure. And I'll just piggyback on uh, some of the items also that Bill said. There really is a shift in how learning is taught. Um, from a technology standpoint, you know, Kelly, you talked to, you touched upon artificial intelligence. And just for those out there that may not be familiar with that topic or what exactly it is, artificial intelligence, you know, basically, um, and machine learning, artificial intelligence, you can think of Alexa, that's an example of artificial intelligence. Um, it's all about decision making. Um, machine learning is all about, it allows systematic um, patterns to be seen. And so I would say in the wealth management, space we're seeing gamification a lot more we're seeing um, artificial intelligence as well as machine learning and i have to say um it's more experiential that is working better through case studies there's a huge uptick in storytelling and i'm getting a lot of requests from clients to 
teach storytelling and to teach um, how to tell an efficient story virtually uh, because you lose some of the facial expressions, you lose, the virtual is not as good as being in person. I can say that, you know, financial services is one of the most data rich industries in the world. So I'll piggyback on what Bill said that from a technology standpoint, definitely um, analytics need to um, be used more effectively. Mm -hmm. And I really think that we can learn a lot from um, the technology to better the customer or the client experience. So that those are the areas that I see as um, how my clients are utilizing technology. Some are buying it from other vendors, some are utilizing consultants, and then some are doing it in-house, but usually it's the larger shops that are doing it in-house. Excellent. Wendy, I appreciate that. It's, it's good to hear the insights from across the board from different organizations and uh, some of the key focuses as well. Uh, Bill, did you want to add anything else to your previous comments? Yes. Uh, first, I just want to be sure you can certainly hear me at this point. Absolutely. Excellent. Oh, sometimes my, my computer system wants to go to sleep on me, I guess. <laughs> certainly one of the other points I just wanted to bring up was I am really fascinated by the concept of artificial intelligence. The more I read about it, the more I realize, you know, this could be something very helpful in the learning and development world. Mm -hmm. And I really am attracted to the fact that this is something that can really help employees to make the best decision possible, which for the company, it's a great way of managing risk. I mean, I think about that teller who's cashing a check and they question it. Mm -hmm. You know, to have a mechanism in place that can maybe help guide them through, mm -hmm. that could really be valuable. And interestingly enough, I was in a meeting with the finance department a couple of days ago, and we were talking about an issue they were having with the different departments reconciling their general ledger tickets and accounts. They have a procedure, but they keep getting the same questions over and over. And I'm sure we can all relate to those departments and the calling with those same questions over and over. Boy, could artificial intelligence really help us with answering those questions directly so we can focus on the other things that we need to do? So this, this really excites me. But I, I wanted to tell a bit of a funny story too uh, before I got cut off, and that was I was talking to a colleague. Uh, her teenage daughter's working remotely from school and she checked in on on the, on the daughter and the daughter had one device going with a chat room with a friend. She had another laptop going <laughs> doing schoolwork and uh, whatever else was going on in there. And I just kind of laughed because I realized that these newer generations are so used to technology. Uh, they almost come to expect it in the workforce. And I remember when I got two monitors on my desktop, I was really excited. So imagine what the younger generations can handle and you know what to attract talent they're really looking for these types of technologies in the workforce so i definitely want to be sure we're there to deliver it absolutely and i think that's a very uh, poignant uh topic in regards to you know when we're talking about two expectations from learners coming in and the different types and you know with the millennials being so much a part of already onboarded in organizations and leaders now in different organizations you know that expectation around being able to have that virtual environment being able to track that virtual environment using ai in different capacities you know i mentioned uh virtual mentors before you know we have ai you know virtual mentors now so we can help employees go through different aspects of it which is perfect because this leads us into the next question, um, which is the next progression into analytics. So in organizations, and you know, we always talk specifically about ROI and being in different types of organizations, being able to provide ROI on training is vitally important. If you're maintaining a budget, if you have to be able to prove your budget, and Wendy, I know that year after year, this has always been you know, a, a challenge for you to do this, maybe you've been highly successful in, in looking at that, but more specifically, having the change in the market where companies are looking for deeper data, um, being able to increase visibility into user um, information to enhance programs. 
Because as a core function, what we do as L&D leaders is we're looking at the trends and it's gone beyond completion, right? So those are the right. old days where did they complete their courses? Oh, that's great. But what else are we able to gather through? And LMSs, unless you have a dedicated analytics component of it, you know, it really doesn't give you that deep dive into that robust, you know, uh, data set. And, and I, I know, Wendy, you have mentioned in regards uh, to that deeper dive in, into analytics, but it's more the visibility into the user experience and connecting, right. right, that user outcome or what I call return on performance to measure that ROI, that ROI to validate, you know, training and development in an organization across the board. So maybe it went, if you wouldn't mind, and then Bill, I'll go back to you, but just talk a little bit more about what you're seeing across the board as far as learning analytics and financial services, please. Sure. And, you know, you hit the nail on the head, Kelly. Um, return on investment or as we say in learning and development, ROI, when ROI goes up, performance goes up and the clients are very, very happy. Sometimes it's not that easy to pr prove ROI. So how prevalent are analytics in 2021? I think they're going to be the deal breaker. I do think uh, those firms and those companies that are either using their LMS analytics more effectively, or they're going out and buying better analytics, um, and there's lots out there that are not that expensive, are going to do better. Because we know in financial services, we love the data. In any learning vertical, we love the data. And metrics are key. And in order to provide, you know, in consulting, you have to have metrics. You have to be able to say to the client, if I deliver X, Y, and Z, you will get X, Y, and Z. So sometimes with mentoring and coaching, it's not that easy uh, to get to solid metrics. So it's gonna be really important that uh, people have better reporting and that I'm seeing uh, firms are wanting to go out and buy better reporting or get better training on their LMS. In some cases, they didn't purchase that part of their LMS. So they're just having to go back and say, hey, I'd like to purchase the analytics package that's a little bit more in depth. Because as we know, uh, numbers talk. Exactly, excellent. Well, Wendy, I really appreciate that, that feedback. And Bill, for you, um, as you're starting to plan out and, and looking at you know, a little bit more in depth around your uh, data for your learners, can you just give us a little bit of insight on you know, what you're looking at as far as analytics is concerned or what your strategy may be moving forward? Yes. One thing for sure is the business goals don't change, but my training strategy definitely does. And I'm constantly looking to make sure I understand the learner and their perspective, even on the manager level, just what they're facing and, and how do they best react to situations. I really try to go for that situation where we have a very well-rounded training experience. And I really have to think, all right, well, learning analytics, you know, what can the data tell me? We have a saying around the bank here called meeting conditions of success. And that is the things that we do to show that what we really invested in has, in a sense, really shown us that ROI or that we're improving, whether it's improving KPIs or improving leading indicators. So somehow there must be a way to leverage all that data that we have out there on how people learn it. You know, when they walk away from a training program, what are they applying and how are they applying it? Is it really working? So I really think that we have just begun breaking the surface of learning analytics for ourselves. And I'm always interested in knowing how we can take that to the next level. Excellent. I'm very glad that, that you're sharing that with us as well. You know, um, I've taken a look at several different uh, institutions um, outside of you know both areas that you're working in right now and there is a huge push that i'm seeing to be able to get to that deeper dive um, and a little bit more strategic focus right on developing the plan to move forward how are we you know measuring successfully organizations are starting to ask themselves now instead of let's just get the you know the learning and development out there let's, let's hit the goals build like what you're talking about but i think the way to build that you're looking at that is highly going to be highly successful because you're looking at things holistically, right? So I think that in itself 
organizations looking at their own plan holistically as opposed to just looking at, you know, certain segments of data. You know, how do we measure things from end to end? That is extremely important. So that that's a trend that's reality and has definitely been and will continue to do that. So I thank the both of you very much for your inputs and insights on, on these core areas. Uh, I think it's been very valuable for the folks that have been on the webinar with us today. Uh, I think that, you know, moving forward and, and you bringing that, I'm going to invite you back as well. But I do know that we've had questions coming through for the both of you. So I think it's a great time to move to our Q&A section of the webinar and take a look at these questions that have been posted. So let me scroll down. There's quite a few of them here, but let me take a look at these. So, um, Wendy, this question is for you. Uh, you had mentioned, and I'm just going to paraphrase this, but different roles of employees uh, shifting or roles in general shifting. Um, and you had mentioned a little bit more higher level on, on L&D roles, but employee roles, can you just give us a little bit further insight on what, what you can clarify a little bit more of, of changing of those roles, please? Sure. So really, there needs to be a, a, a blended approach to the new blended roles. So for instance, if you are a leader or a manager, I've been finding with clients that they're not, they would like, they need some upskilling, they need some more training on how to be an effective manager in a virtual world. So uh, they need to help out with their communication style. Um, they need to have a set time that they communicate. Um, I've even seen where clients have had a senior manager that once a week he or she will have like a half hour where anybody can drop by virtually and ask any question they want to ask. And that's been incredibly um, effective. I can tell you that because the roles are, are blended now and people are not just A, they're A, B, C, um, they're having to take on other skills. So it's going to be really critical that as learners in the industry, we make sure that we have the upskilling and that we reskill. So I've been getting a lot of calls about um, doing specifically for leaders and managers to help them. Excellent. Thank you, Wendy, for that. Um, Bill, this question is for you um, dealing with, uh, so the question is, how do you prioritize training initiatives with employees working remotely? All right, the two big key concepts there is one, looking at the, the business goals of the company. You know, what is the most important priority? You know, in our particular case, it really is building customer relationships and sales but also listening to the employee and seeing what is it that's concerning them, whether we reach out by survey or having discussions or feedback from managers. That's going to really be key. What are their pain points? What can you really do to alleviate those pain points and as quickly as possible? Very good, thank you. Uh, here's another question. I think this is the both of you can address this and you know, uh, Wendy, let's start with you, but this talks a little bit more specifically about the customer service going experience, excuse me, going back to the reference in the beginning of the webinar. Um, they don't want to know uh, what are your best uh, practices for enhancing the customer experience or what you've seen with organizations and built, and we'll go to you to answer the question, okay? Sure. Overall, what I'm seeing really is, um, better communication it goes back to that better communication within the organization so that um, you can improve the client experience taking the feedback in what are your clients saying you know sometimes it's just being a good listener um, because they're afraid and uh, the pandemic has created a lot of fear around clients so sometimes it feels like being a psychologist but when you're client facing you really need to up your listening skills. So I've done a lot of um, work with employees and how to uh, give better cues for listening skills. Please tell me more about that. Tell me more and then stop 
and let them talk. Because oftentimes what you're finding is maybe what they're initially upset about isn't really the root factor of what they're upset about. So really it starts with understanding what the client's needs are and then addressing it. And also the layer of really doing some upskilling and some retraining for the employees themselves. Great. Bill, I'll pose the same question to you about customer experience. Yes, first and foremost, it's important that we're in tune with what the customer wants and what they're expecting when they walk through the doors or when they uh, bank with us mm -hmm. online. And making sure that our frontline staff and even our support staff, they have the knowledge and they have the know-how to answer those questions or communicate how these products and services can truly help them. It's just making sure they understanding that having a relationship with the bank is very key for their success financially. So it's going to be our goal to be able to help employees just having that information right at their fingertips. Very good. This question, the next question that comes up uh, talks about, um, I think it goes back to the gap with uh, leadership and uh, the trust, when you refer to, in the development of, of the online learning. And maybe both of you talk, and Bill will start with you, give you a little bit more on how you're bridging that gap with leadership or how you're working with leadership um, as you're presenting your strategy. Um, so there's continuity and there's an alignment. I, it, it definitely says alignment here with uh, leadership and learning uh, goals. So one of the first things that we implemented was a huddle system where we have the managers come together to discuss what's going on out there and what challenges are you seeking. So when we hear from them directly, we're better able to respond to their needs and provide whatever information or guidance would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. We're also hearing back from what the executive team is sharing with us with what they hear from their staff and really paying attention to what can be very helpful out there from what I hear from my peers. And I think when we talk about change management, I really think that is one of the big ones. We get so comfortable and I get comfortable and we really need to be prepared for the unexpected. Very good, Wendy, same question to you. Yeah, I'll piggyback on what Bill said. I completely agree. It all starts with communication and it's communication with your clients but it's also communication with leadership. So do you have a communication plan? Bill, I love the fact that you're doing a huddle. Um, and I've seen other clients that are having regularly scheduled meetings that are not structured. Here's the agenda, here's what we're gonna do, but it's kind of open forums to be able to speak. Um, and what are you seeing out there? I also think that we're seeing a uh, huge change in how we onboard new employees um, and I know Kelly you shared with me um, your vibe program for onboarding and how effective that has been bringing in new employees um, and that was something that is virtual which is you know the learning's completely virtual but it's been really effective I think there needs to be more revamping of materials so they're more interactive we need to listen more to our employees and what they want, leaders especially have to listen more and stop having meetings where they just tell, tell, tell. They need to listen and then they need to adapt. Very good, excellent. Bill, any final comments on that? I really do agree with what Wendy has to say and it really is something very important that we all continue to be sensitive to strong communications and listening to what our employees have to say. Excellent, very good. Well, there are several other questions here, but um, we are gonna close out the webinar. You practically answered every single thing that has been brought up in one shape or form. Um, I thank the both of you so much for your time today and your level of expertise, not only in the l and world, um, but also in the financial services. Uh, it's a huge uh, compliment for, for KGL to have both of you contribute today. Um, I appreciate it greatly. Um, and I wanna thank the community for being on the webinar today. If 
we will send out to you a link, as I mentioned, prior to the webinar. It will also be on our website. Um, if you have any additional questions that you want answered or addressed by Wendy or, or Bill, my contact information is on the screen right now. But thank you, and I appreciate it, and I appreciate everybody's time today, and um, wish you the best. And Wendy and Bill, we're going to invite you back later on in the season to do a part two of this webinar. So I'm uh, very grateful for your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.